Welcome to Cage Minds MMA Show. I'm your host, Mike Frankel. Be appreciated much if you checked out the website, cageminds.com. Also, keep up with everything from the website on our social media. That's Cage Minds Combat Sports News on Facebook, at Cage Minds underscore CSN on Instagram, and then the original at Cage Minds MMA on Twitter. My dog is going nuts in the background playing with a squeaker. Just in case you're hearing that faintly, we're going to let him though play. We're just going to keep going here. Also got a couple of other podcasts I'm a part of. You find those also here on the website. It's part of the After Hours Podcast Network. We're talking about pro wrestling after hours and MMA after hours. Glad to say I'm back from UFC 269. Oh my gosh talking about like on a professional scale the second time I got to be media for UFC event third time being live for UFC event that was incredible and we're gonna get to that in just a moment but you know I gotta touch on LFA LFA 120 the promotions final event of the year and we do have a new women's flyweight champion crown and it is the Canadian Jamie Lynn Horth punishing striking incredible grappling and the rear naked choke finish in the third round co-main event Bruno Assis defeats Jalen Fuller Hans Fuller his first professional loss it went all three Assis had got the armbar position early and that really did look to have injured affected hampered the game plan of fuller who gutted through won some positions got on top as sees with some of the most violent hammer fists from the bottom that i've ever seen busting fuller's nose so as sees now 12 and 5 gets the victory and did it in impressive fashion winning so many positions i think nearly had that arm bar like three times and then not to mention on the card we saw the professional debut of Royce White, the big three former NBA player, not to mention his counterpart, former Temple fullback, Daquan Buckley. This fight also will go the distance. My surprise, because two big heavyweights, two Division One athletes, pro debuts. I thought we'd see a slobber knocker. Buckley, from the get-go, was looking for the takedown. You saw White being cognizant of that action he knew the takedown was coming was trying to keep the distance use his long limbs I was surprised when we went to the scorecards to see the judges be so in cohesion I thought we we're gonna put the split decision going one way or the other because I really did think that there were the striking was in favor of white white landed the bigger shots in the first and second round he was able to paw with that left hand shoot the right hand down the gap and it looked like the powerful strikes even though he was taken down in every round the significant strike factor went in white's favor i felt like early on in both the first and second round the grappler gets it done though i would have liked to have seen more activity more damage out of buckley with the top time that he had Still, though, Buckley comes out on top. Now, here is where we get to the UFC. UFC 269, there in Las Vegas, the T-Mobile Arena, the two world title fights. You had the main event, and there's where we're going to start. The light heavyweight champion defense, Charles Oliveira, with a rear naked choke in the third round, submits Dustin Poirier, the win streak continues. Oliveira shows grit and toughness. Because in the first round, with both guys landing big shots, you saw the left hand was shooting down the pipe. It took a moment for Oliveira to adjust to the southpaw. That look gave him issues, got hit with some big shots. When he was able to adjust, went to the body, the knees, which I thought were going to be pivotal, did hurt Poirier, took some out of the gas tank. Second round, Oliveira able to recover because it looked like he was going to be put out in the latter stages of the first round. He attacks 
the takedown, and Oliveira with the top time is able to grind out the entire second round. Poirier would later say that he felt he was too far away from the cage to try to butt scoot. That's the information he gave us in the post-fight press conference. Didn't want to open up his guard, try for a stand-up, do something silly, and give Oliveira an even more advantageous position to try a spectacular submission while well, they were dry. Or at least drier than they would have been later. So he ate four minutes of ground and pound to the third round where, again, Oliveira attacks the takedown, but doesn't get it, gets around to the back, jumps on the back, and it's a standing rear naked choke victory. There was no getting out of that rear naked choke. There are some people I've already heard say they were disappointed in the tap that Poye tapped out too early. I don't think anything good was coming of that position. I think that with a finisher, a submission finisher like Charles Oliveira, the level he is at, there was no getting out of that position. Maybe some people wanted to see Poye struggle all the way to the ground, go all the way to sleep, but either way, he was in checkmate. It's the end to the story that no one wanted to see. Well, not many wanted to see. There's a lot of us there that were there for sport and competition. A lot of gamblers that didn't predict this. But Poirier had been the story of the week leading in. It was the story of the opening of the pay-per-view. The Diamond, who had already foregone his opportunity to fight for the world title. Taking the money fight. Going after the second opportunity with Conor McGregor. Dana White at the press conference saying, People have criticized Poirier. He did the right thing. He went after the money fights. And now he's coming for the belt. So it felt like Oliveira was an observer to the Poirier coronation all week long. Where we already had the Bronx, the kid from the favelas, who was there to fight for respect the whole time. Everybody's seen the meme going around the internet by now. At a point 10 and 8 in his UFC career, and now a 10 by win streak. It was a foregone conclusion that Charles Oliveira was a transitional champion, going to be a paper champion, never solidify himself to these lengths. He overcame the odds, the adversity, ate damage early, fought back, implemented his grappling, and was able to defend the title. Our reigning champion is still Charles Oliveira. He said history will remember his name, definitely will, as Charles Oliveira now looks forward to a matchup with Justin Gaethje. That's obvious. Dana White said that going in. It's an interesting matchup. Gaethje's power punching, also being a bit vulnerable though to body strikes and to get submitted by Habib just like Dustin Poirier. So there's some similarities. The leg kicking ability of Justin Gaethje does change up the striking dynamic from what Dustin Poirier was offering. Not to mention, we've seen crushing knockouts for his entire career from Justin Gaethje where Poirier had came on. But it's still stylistically a very similar matchup. Now on the other side, where does Dustin Poyego. Well, first thing he's going to do is take some time, obviously recover. Uh, the man is a spectacular human being, as everybody's seen, offering $20,000 to a charity in Oliveira's local nation to try to better his neighborhood. So Dustin Poyego always giving to charity and trying to better communities. You got to wonder, though, where does he go in his fight career? The options prior to the fight, it sounded like there was a possibility and murmurs of Kamaru Usman, Poye going up to 170. Now let's be honest, that is still a possibility. There's a last fight on a Nate Diaz contract and him and Poye have been talking for a very long time. And if it's not going to be Conor McGregor, Nate Diaz, what I feel like it is going to be, Dustin Poirier is another option if it just doesn't come together because Conor McGregor is calling out Charles Oliveira who, saying on Twitter, when do I fight Oliveira? And everybody could answer back very easily, well, we see you at over 190 pounds. So probably when you lose a bunch of weight and you go on a win streak, at least one, maybe even two, 
then you can fight Charles Oliveira. It's funny. It's been pointed out already by Brandon Fitzgerald. Charles Oliveira went from calling out Conor McGregor and getting no response and nearly being laughed at by people to Conor McGregor having to call out Charles Oliveira to get what he wants. The power is in Oliveira's hands. That's great for him. Poirier, I bring up welterweights and got around to Conor McGregor because of Dustin Poirier, which... If McGregor's still angry, that is a big money fight if you just don't know what you want to do. Poirier, obviously still a big name, still does have some drawing power, so there are going to be some big fights and options out there for him. But like I'm saying, Diaz, McGregor, those two are the first names that just jump off the page for Dustin Poirier. Co-main event shock the world. Juliana Pena submits and dethrones Amanda Nunez. The arena goes into shock. Honestly, if you've listened to MMA After Hours, you know I do it with Mr. Michael Carlisle. That's who I'm there in Las Vegas with. We are fifth level media area watching this fight happen. Nunez is landing some big strikes early. Those leg kicks knocks down Pena. Seemed to be smiling. Had a very dominant first round. Pena would say that she had an arm lock, but it looked like that was non-threatening. Totally a Nunez round in that first round. We get to a second round where they start exchanging the jab. And for some reason... You don't see any movement. You don't see a reset. You see the defense come down. And the early success with the leg kicks was not there. Pena starts to answer, countering with the jab. And at a point, it looks like Nunez just gets into a mode of where she wants to answer back. I'm getting hit. I want to hit you back. And they're exchanging jabs. And Pena is lighting up Nunez. And I think that starts to short circuit some of the faculties and thought process, the decision making abilities of Nunez where she's not able to land the overhand right. She's getting hit with these one twos. We fast forward to a third round where the takedown by Pena sees a back give by Nunez. Pena jumps on top for the rear naked choke. And a lot of us will accuse Nunez of a fast tap. When I was watching it there live, as it's happening, I'm screaming, she's going to tap. I could see it coming. As Pena was even crawling up the back, it looked like the neck was slightly exposed. When you watch it on TV, when you see it up close, you're able to see that Nunez had her jaw turned, her neck kind of turned. And you could possibly see where it wasn't so much a choke, but it was a crunch, a crank. The pressure was there. Pena is very confident that nothing else was going to happen besides damage to the lioness in that situation and that the obvious best situation or best result was for Nunez to tap. A plus 600 underdog. A minus 1,000 favorite. The upset of the year and one of the top three biggest upsets in MMA history. Now let me explain this real quick. Number one will always be Sarah beating GSP. Overwhelming favorite, multiple skills, and if anything, the advantage in the striking realm was much greater than the advantage in the grappling. Unprobable peak versus latter stages of career that all matters in the size conversation of who had the biggest upset. Now, number two, Holly Holm, Amanda, uh, Holly Holm, Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey was the unquestioned face of the promotion, the division, undefeated, racking up finishes like crazy, was being unchallenged, and Holly Holm wins with a knockout. Nobody saw that coming. Very few predicted it. Even though Holm had come over from boxing as a multiple time world champion. That didn't ensure anything. We've seen many other boxers fail 
and with the kind of favorite that Rousey was and the overall su success she had had against multiple skill sets, it all mattered. That one is number two. This comes in at number three, whereas the betting odds were correct, and not many of us had faith in Juliana Pena. You have to remember that this is the fifth loss of Amanda Nunez's career. The Lioness gets tired, and the finish or beating her is possible. We thought a lot of that had been remedied, and I had said prior that if there was a path to success for Pena, it was going to be the speed, the weight cut affecting Nunez, and quite possibly then catching her in a submission. All of that came to fruition. I wish I would have put money on it. All hail to the queen, and it looks like a rematch is the automatic trajectory. As I prepared to do the show, I was going down multiple pathways. Because during fight week, Pena had said that she was not looking to move up to 45 to take Nunez's other belt, and that she had not really felt that 125 was going to be a possibility. That 135 was her trajectory. In the post-fight press conference, she did bring up Valentina Shevchenko in 125. So bring up other possibilities, which really would all be dictated by what Amanda Nunez wanted to do. You got to think that she had three options, realistically. The rematch? Maybe, maybe, maybe you're able to talk the UFC into... I still got this 145 title, and there's a Norma Dumont out there who is the only other featherweight on the roster. We could give her a world title fight, stick me in another co-main event, let me have a fight, get some confidence back, and then either retire or have the rematch. Or you go right for the rematch. And according to the Instagram, it's the rematch. The Lioness wants some time off, some time to close up some holes. She wants the rematch. Juliana Pena wants some time to go celebrate with her family and her daughter, and she's ready to do the rematch. So at least we know right away where the women's bad and weight title is going, and we're going to get part two. And obviously, it's deserved. It. it was a massive upset, and Nunez, the greatest double champ of all time, yes, don't forget that, defended both titles on multiple occasions. We haven't seen a double champ do that at all in major MMA. So I look forward to that one. We saw a welterweight feature fight where Jeff Neal, I mean, that guy came with so much adversity. I didn't think mentally, how could you gain the composure and get the focus to win a fight? Well, he did so against Santiago Ponzinibbio. We go three rounds. Early head kick cuts open Ponzinibbio, who didn't do his best work. He did do some good work with some leg kicks, but Jeff Neal, the punching power in the department, was just doing more jet, more damage, more impactful. And in all, he kept Ponzinibbio on the back foot more often. Jeff Neal in the win column. And we'll see what ranked opponent he gets next. Kai Kara France seemed to be a forgotten thought during fight week. This was Cody Garbrandt going down to 125. Now, we knew there were a lot of questions heading in about Garbrandt, but to be honest, with the heat at the press conference with Sean O'Malley, you, you were already couldn't help yourself but to think of what was next, what was ahead, what bigger fights awaited. Kai Kara France even made things a bit personal, the throat slash, trying to ignite the fire at the ceremonial weigh-ins and then the kiwi comes out with that one two jabbing being more effective the right hand bombs two knockdowns and garbrandt is down and out another knockout loss for no love who when we saw the ceremonial weigh-ins up close the incredible size and advantage where it seemed like carl france had maybe put on five pounds was 130. Garbrandt seemed to be 140, 145. It seemed like this was going to be a foregone conclusion. The bigger man was going to be able to hurt the smaller fighter, but the speed difference and no love, possibly, no chance. I something happened and things disconnected, and Garbrandt went to sleep pretty quickly. And you have to wonder 
what is the future of Cody Garbrandt. Kai Kata France heard rumors he wants a title fight, possibly even a number one contender's bout, and you got to think he earned it just because he came in at number six. There's not too many guys ahead of him. After UFC 270, we got the trilogy fight, Figueiredo, Moreno 3, somebody has to step up. Alex Pettis unable to fight. Maybe Alex Pettis, Kai Kata France. You make a number one contenders fight there. Very quick turnaround in the UFC to get somebody ready to fight for the belt after we have a definitive champion with the trilogy going into the past. That seems like a good plan to me. Cody Garbrandt did have that stare down with Sean O'Malley. And Sean O'Malley did put it on Julian Paiva. Paiva came in ranked at number 15. Now I think I saw that Cody Stammen has actually taken that number 15. But Dana White at the press conference did say it's time to pay Sean O'Malley. It started off with the jab, hurting Paiva with right hooks, flurries of shots, and landing from both sides, moving switching stances and the big TKO comes. It was impressive. He's made a slow climb up the rankings or up up this path towards the rankings and O'Malley, a savvy businessman and I questioned his popularity if it really is what we're seeing on TV. Then you see the O'Malley jerseys and merchandise as you're walking around Las Vegas and he definitely has that it factor that appeal he has that celebrity effect his tattoos his hair the music that he's come out to it has connected with the generation and this could be a point where forget the rankings a big money fight and a last stand for Cody Garbrandt they had a fire they had heat at the press conference and that's sure fire an opportunity for a fight night main event, if nothing else, a fight night co-main event. But you probably want to put those two again on the big stage. So it's going to be the feature fight of a pay-per-view. And that's what you should do with Sean O'Malley. Cody No Love would get one last stand, one big opportunity. Just because it's an intriguing storyline for the former champion. Does he have what it takes? If not, O'Malley gets a win over a former champion and can demand even more money as he's headed to rank fights. Because on the other hand, Marab Davishvili called him out, and Song Yudong is about there at number 14, Cody Stammen at 15. I don't know if I'm liking those matchups as much for O'Malley as Garbrandt and that name recognition. On the prelims, Josh Emmett comes back. He gets the decision win over a Dan Ige that shows he's double tough. And this is a position where Emmett gets to start making his run at the title. It's a four-fight win streak. He has to worry that Giga Chikotse, Calvin Cater, that winner is ahead of him. Or that could be the guy he's looking at fighting. Dominic Cruz. Maybe it was a slip. Most likely looked like he got knocked down there in the first round. Come back back in the second and third rounds to overwork, overwhelm, outwork. It's 103 to 74 and landed strikes and Cruz shows off his toughness, gets the decision win. He called for a fight with Jose Aldo. Aldo is waiting to hear back from TJ Dillashaw and if Dillashaw somehow is able to not take a fight before getting his opportunity at the winner or the presumed what will be winner of Jan Sterling, then you could see Aldo Cruz become a reality. Heavyweight division, tied to Ivasa, that's a four fight win streak, sent Augusta Sakai into another dimension, a rough first round. Sakai is landing knees in the clinch. The second round, we got to Ivasa with the left hand clipping Sakai. Then he cuts off the cage, puts Sakai on the fence, flurries, and a right cross through the middle, puts down the Brazilian. The Australian, unranked, guess he's taking the Brazilian's number 11. That's a big one. As we saw the push, a huge early push in his octagon UFC career, the three-fight win streak, three-fight losing streak. Now he's won four in a row, and you wonder if we're seeing the makings of a guy that's going to push towards the top. You have people like the guy 
Guys, we're going to talk about in this weekend's Fight Night main event ahead of Tuivasa, but he comes another intriguing name in what is a resurging division. Bruno Silva versus Jordan Wright at middleweight. Early on, some big head kicks from Wright. Pushed Silva back to the cage, got the tie clinch, was flooring with knees, and Silva starts teeing off with hooks. Clips right, clips him again, drops him, and stops him. The Brazilian, 21 and 6 coming in. That's 22 with 19 knockouts walking out. So, with that win streak, another middleweight trying to get towards some rank competition. Unfortunately, due to a short notice change, Andre Muniz did not have a ranked opponent. He came in with the number 15, and he submits Eric Anders. Another arm bar. The takedowns, the aggression. This time, in the second round, he pulls down the back, from the back, gets the arm bar. Muniz, dude, the guy has striking. He has grappling. Another one to watch at 185. A division that needed some life to it and I like this prospect at 125 Aaron Blanchfield the jiu-jitsu thought she was gonna get the TKO from the crucifix position in the second round but beats Miranda Maverick so she'll move into the rankings it's hard not to want to push the 22 year old too fast too soon she keeps winning and she's beating people in the rankings might get to Valentina before she's ready for that kind of competition but if you keep beating people, I guess it's inevitability. Ryan Hall beats Derek Maynard by decision. And Hall, with the grappling, the leg locks, the arm bars, the triangle attempts, everything that Minner's corner wanted for Minner to anti-grapple, get away from it, somehow the hooks and the big uppercut still led to the clinch position. And Hall back into the win column. He was ranked at a point. A bunch of injuries took him away from the rankings. He's hoping for an active 2022 and trying to get back towards those numbers and an ultimate goal of a title fight. Tony Kelly drives 22 hours from Louisiana to Las Vegas and then gets the TKO win over Randy Costa. Kelly looked to put on a fast pace early. People thought if it was an early finish, it was going to be from Costa. So Kelly countered that with ultimate aggression, pitter pat punches, and non stop offense. Overwhelming Costa, never allowing Costa to set and fire, blasting knees to the body, then forcing Costa into takedowns. A knee, it's all done on the ground and pound. And the night started off with Jillian Roberts submitting Priscilla Cachetta. Cachetta, I tried to eye gouge her way out of the rear naked choke. Early on, though, the Brazilian landed some big shots, but got taken down, mounted, gave up her back. And like I said, tried dirty defense, couldn't stop the choke. Jillian Robertson with the submission win. Get to this week's UFC fight announcements. UFC Fight Night on January 15th is added at Featherweight, Gabriel Benitez versus TJ Brown. UFC 271 has been announced for February 12th in Houston, Texas. The headliner will be a middleweight title bout. The rematch that Australia and New Zealand has been waiting for. Israel Adesanya defense against Robert Whittaker. UFC Fight Night on February 19th is going to see a strawweight edition as Diana Belletta is taking on Gloria DiPaolo. UFC Fight Night on March 19th. We've got two fights on that card announced at featherweight, Mike Grundy versus Maclon Amerikani. And at flyweight, top European prospect, Muhammad Mokayev versus Cody Durant. We've got some Bellator fight announcements. Bellator 273 has been announced for Phoenix, Arizona. We'll see the heavyweight title unification bout there on January 28th. 
with Ryan Bader and Valentin Moldovsky. And then at featherweight, Darian Caldwell is going to take on tough Latino 2 winner Enrique Barzola making his Bellator debut first fight since parting ways with the UFC. Now this week there is a ton of stuff going on. Thursday night, UFC Invitational Team Grappling on UFC Fight Pass. That's going to be comprised of four teams. LFA Vets, Fury FC Vets, Cage Fury FC Vets, and FAC Vets. Then on the docket Friday morning here in the U.S., it's Friday morning, you have one championship, Winter Warriors 2 from Singapore. The main event appears to be a number one contender's bout in the flyweight division, Karat Amatov versus Danny King Ad. Then former champions are also on the card. you got a trio of them, Vitaly Bigdash, Sebastian Kadistem, and Kevin Belong, all on that one card, their last one of the year. Friday night, UFC Fight Pass, you got a trio of events. Titan FC 43, two championship belts are on the line on that one. Cage Fury FC 104 from Atlantic City, New Jersey, also two championship bouts. And then Unified MMA 42 from Canada again. You're going to see some big names on that card. You have Saturday morning, also on Fight Pass, Venator 9 from Italy. And Saturday morning from Poland, you have KSW 65. That one is headlined by welterweight champion Roberto Selec, challenging Mohamed Khalidov. I mean, that dude is a powerful knockout artist, the middleweight champion for his title. So Selec is trying to become a two-division world champion. Not to mention, Saldin Parnas attempts to regain the KSW featherweight title from the man he lost it to, Daniel Torres. And then before we get to the UFC event, our big preview, I want to tell you guys that Sunday, also on UFC Fight Pass, there's the Eddie Bravo Combat Jiu-Jitsu event that's going to feature Cowboy Cerrone versus Grappling Sensation Craig Jones. And you also have Fury FC 55 featuring three UFC vets and an LFA vet. It's UFC Fight Night Lewis versus Dawkins from the Apex. We're talking top 10 heavyweights. Number three ranked Derek Lewis versus number seven Chris Dawkins. Lewis has won four of five. Yes, coming off of the loss to Cyril Gaon in the interim heavyweight title bout. But this is the guy with the most knockouts in UFC heavyweight history at 12 and has 20 of his 25 career wins by knockout. It only takes one little touch of a punch for Derek Lewis to turn out the lights. While on the other side, Chris Dawkins has 12 wins and 11 come by knockout, a five-fight win streak. One, his last one in CFFC, and then 4-0 now in the UFC. Dawkins is a combination puncher. His boxing is crisp and clean. He stays a little bit longer and does more work, puts up more volume than Lewis. So it's going to be, can Dawkins keep the range and outwork Lewis without getting caught, mix in the takedowns, and try to have the bigger fighter work. A big opportunity for Dawkins, like we said, seven versus three. Lewis, how many more opportunities does he get at the world title? Lost to Daniel Cormier, loses this interim title fight to Surreal Gone. Maybe there's an opportunity one more time to get back in there to go against Francis Ngannou if Ngannou does beat Gone. For Chris Dawkins, this is part of the youth insurgence that we're seeing in the UFC's heavyweight division. Tom Aspinall is coming up, Taya Tuivasa just got a win, and then Chris Dawkins can take that number three spot with a victory. So it's good to see the UFC's marquee heavyweight division getting a youth infusion. And yes, there are still names like Steve Miocic, John Jones. John really isn't that old. Who knows if we'll see him back ever that are there in the mix, but it's good to see the youth is coming. Co-main event, talking about top ten welterweights. Number 5, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson against number 10, Bilal Muhammad. Thompson has won 
three and three, gone with three and three in his last six. But he's two and one in his last three. Two wins coming over Vicente Luque and Jeff Neal. Two aggressive boxing, power punching, looking for the takedown fighters. The same thing that he saw in a loss to Gilbert Burns. The same thing that he's going to see against Bilal Muhammad. But for Bilal Muhammad, there's only one Wonder Boy Thompson. And even with incredible training partners, I don't know if you're able to, make, to mimic the one-of-a-kind, high-level IQ counter-striking that Wonder Boy Thompson offers. These two combined for 33 wins, 22 decisions. I feel like there is an opportunity for the knockout, but a probability of a long night. Also on the main card, also about between ranked fighters, we got number 11, Amanda Lemoyche, against number 12, Angela Hill. The number 12 is going to come up a couple times here in the women's strawweight division. Now Lemoyche, seven knockouts, a four-fight win streak, three first-round finishes of her four in the UFC. Now Angela Hill, five wins by knockout, of her 13, former Invicta FC champion, but she's lost three of her last four. Two of those, though, coming by split decision to Claudia Gadelia and Michelle Watterson. So there is an argument, a little bit here, maybe an angle there, and you would see three and one in her last four. In the Bantamweight division, we got Rafael Sansa. He comes in at number 12, taking on Ricky Simone. So we got the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner and Austin Sao, who has big punching power, taking on Ricky Simone, who's willing to mix it up. I don't think he has as much power in his hands, but he is the more aggressive fighter, and he has the more well rounded ground game. His grappling. Ricky Simone, I would say has the more functional wrestling for MMA, and he's going to be constantly looking for that takedown, looking to wear down the gas tank of Austin Sao. In the lightweight division, we got number 12, Diego Fajeda, taking on Matheus Gamrat. All these situations where you're taking on an unranked fighter, these guys are obviously fighting to keep that number next to their name. Now, Gamrat knocked out Scott Holtzman. He submitted Jeremy Stevens in his last outing. Fajeda has lost two in a row following a six-fight win streak that included submitting Anthony Pettis and opening up the main card, a spectacular bout between veterans as Darren Elkins takes on Cub Swanson. So you can imagine that Elkins is going to be in Swanson's face and Swanson is going to be looking for the knockout, trying to move around, and hopefully has got his miles in because he's going to be running backwards, I feel like, a lot, trying to avoid the pressure of Elkins and staying off the cage, trying to stay on the pivot and hitting the angles. Now, on the prelims, there's a couple I wanted to touch on before I let you guys go. In the Bantamweight division, we got Hayani Barcelos taking on short notice UFC debuter Victor Henry. Barcelos has won five of six, two knockouts, and a submission in the UFC. That's nine of ten he's won overall. And Henry, he's replacing Trevin Jones, but he comes in with wins in eight of his last nine. So that one, one to keep an eye on because Barcelos at 16-2 and two, is knocking on the door for a big fight if he can get his weight under control. In the heavyweight division, Henry Hunsucker versus Justin Taffa. The two combined for 11 wins and 100% finishing rate. So somebody is getting finished in that one. We have a ranked matchup Way down on the card, it's number three on the card, where Raquel Pennington, who's number eight in the world at 135 in the women's division, takes on number 10, Macy Chasson. I feel like this one is going to be a grinded out battle in the clinch. Chasson comes in longer, but Pennington has the smoother boxing, has the better distance management and decision making of what strikes to throw, but I feel like this one battles in the clinch. Also a heavyweight matchup, Dantel Mays and Josh Parisian battle, both coming in off of wins over Roki Martinez. And opening up the card at lightweight, Matt Sales moving 
up 10 pounds from 45. He had just been submitted in his last outing by Twister. And he's going to take on Jordan Levitt. 8-1, and one, and Levitt has 6 wins by submission, so Sale's really being put up against it in that one. And on one last note, a congratulations to Tevin Dice, to AJ Robb, and Amanda Lovato, all on their wins this past weekend. Again, I'd appreciate it if you go to the website cageminds.com, the YouTube channel is Cage Minds MMA Show, After Hours Podcast Network, MMA After Hours, Pro Wrestling After Hours, wherever you listen to your podcast. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.